Hi, so first, a quick introduction of ourselves. Today is going to be slightly unusual. It's going to be a combined talk. So most of your speakers today have been singular speakers. Today I present to you myself, Rewen, and Connor. Hi guys. We are from Bilpin. As some of you might know, some of you might be using Bilpin. Bilpin is a very simple app that allows you to share bills with friends. If you're going out for dinner, if you're, going, if you're sharing an apartment, and you need to split bills regularly with a bunch of people, Bilpin is the application to use. Right? We've been working on Billpin for about the past year now, and <clears throat> we are present on most major platforms. So it's iOS, Android, and web. And particularly on web, we have come across this really interesting framework, uh, that's called AngularJS. Um, you might say it's up and coming. It's fairly popular right now, I think. And today we're here to share with you a few tips and tricks uh, that we've learned in the past year developing Billpin with AngularJS. Right? So without further ado, let's check it out. AngularJS. One of the really nice features of AngularJS is it allows you to write your templates as templates, right? There are many uh, JavaScript templating frameworks out there, many front-end templating frameworks. And if you look around, most of them require you to write some form of funky JavaScript and translate that JavaScript into HTML in your head, right? Uh, that's really not fun. I am not a compiler, you are not a compiler, so why should we be mentally compiling JavaScript to HTML? That's just stupid. Secondly, because widgets are fantastic, basic computer science, right? OO programming, object-oriented programming, right? You take your functionality, you encapsulate them in nice little reusable chunks. Where is that in HTML, right? I want an autocomplete widget, I have to declare uh, element here, I have to initialize it over here, declare it over there, initialize it over there. Again, that's stupid, right? AngularJS allows us to create reusable widgets that we can just plug in wherever we want in our code, encapsulate the functionality and the data that we want in those widgets, and just reuse them just like that, right? No more just messing around with elements over here, code over there, and all around the place, right? This really, really, speeds up your development process because if I want an autocomplete widget, I have an autocomplete widget. Fair? Right. Because our assets are really worth saving. Right? Because of all these inefficiencies with existing technology, your development time becomes really, really slow because you need to keep track of all these things in your head. Do I have my code here? Do I have my initializations in the right place here? Right? AngularJS is designed to eliminate many of those inefficiencies. It's changing the way a fundamental technology of web development works, and that fundamental technology is HTML. HTML defines literally the structure of the web, and AngularJS allows us to improve upon that. So, diving further into our points. I am not a compiler. If I was born to compile JavaScript to HTML on my head, I wouldn't really be human. I want to contrast Backbone, right? Which is another very popular JavaScript framework. And I'd like to showcase our repeating list. So you guys have heard of to do MVC, right? Right, so to do MVC um, shows you sample to do applications in various JavaScript frameworks. I'm taking a sample out of Backbone.js. So in order, I just took the little bit that renders the individual to do items. And this is what I have to do in Backbone. For example, create a Backbone View, define a template which is here, define some events, and blah 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 blah. Right? And initially I talked about when I'm writing templates, I want to write templates. Has anybody seen a template up here yet? No, right? Because your template is defined separately here. Alright, so now I've got two separate chunks of code defining two different sets of functionality that I have to keep in sync in my head. This is how AngularJS does it. I have a list of items that I say I would like to repeat. So I have a list of to-do items. I just say li, ng repeat for i and items. My template is right here, where I can see it, where I can pass it, where I can understand what it's doing in my application. And I know AngularJS is just going to repeat that. The benefit of it of AngularJS or so is that it understands your models, 
items in this case is a model. So if any elements in items changes, boom, AngularJS Angular re-renders the entire list. Right? So you don't have to worry about making sure that, oh, I have to watch this object, update my <coughs> HTML when this changes. I just change the data, presentation changes. Right? So the beauty of AngularJS is when I'm writing templates, I am writing templates. Right? Widgets. Right? So changing the fundamental structure of the web itself. So obviously, this is not a standard HTML widget. But you can create things like this in, uh, in Angular. So take, for example, one very common use case uh, or one very common thing that we see in many applications nowadays is integrating the Facebook SDK. And anyone who's worked with the Facebook SDK before understands that you have to paste this chunk of JavaScript and HTML into your application, right? You know what I'm talking about, right? And you know, sometimes, does it really have to be so messy? I mean, one chunk of that, I don't immediately know what that snippet does, right? I can write an AngularJS widget that looks like this. FB, app ID, my app ID. I can tell AngularJS, hey, I'm gonna encapsulate the Facebook SDK in just this one widget, right? The code to do that, okay. So this is one example, simple example. I can expand my widget to take in additional parameters. Um, for example, init. So once the widget bootstraps itself into the page, inserts itself into the DOM, I can run uh, an init script to set up you know, whatever things that I would like to, to do. The code for it looks like that. Looks a bit scary at first. Uh, but this allows you to package functionality into individual widgets. Broken down, it's very simple. It just says, make this an element, replace it with this IP, uh, FBID, this bit here, yeah. right? And apply various attributes to the replaced element, right? So as you can see, this is one example of how we can use a widget. I um, believe Connor has a few more examples. Would you like to take that? Sure. Okay, so Raywan showed you the plug and play structure of Angular, where you can just insert your widget into the HTML. Angular will take care of expanding it out for you along with the behavior. So something else that you can do actually is that you don't necessarily have to create a widget that gets expanded out into your Facebook element, for example. What you can do is you can write behavior-based directives. So there we have the example of use Ajax. And this directive, as Raywin said, looks a little intimidating, but the behavior is very simple. Basically, you put this attribute on a form element, you just add it, you say use Ajax, and you, you just throw it on there, and what it'll do is that when somebody submits that form, instead of doing a full page refresh and taking you to a new URL, it'll automatically take care of doing the Ajax request for you. So just having this bit of JavaScript here, so you can see this is actually making the Ajax request for us. Having this bit of JavaScript, you never have to duplicate this or clone this or put this in many places. You just throw the single attribute of use Ajax on multiple forms and all the forms across your website will automatically make this Ajax request for you. And depending on what info you give this directive, you can say, I want to go to this location afterwards. So all that behavior is just magically taken care of for you. So, didn't time for the other example. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, so as you can see, we, we, we put this slide deck together fairly last minute, right? Uh, another cool feature of AngularJS is it really supports testing. Um, the way that AngularJS components are designed, are uh, designed from the ground up with testing in mind. That means you can abstract your functionality into services, controllers, widgets, directives, and each of these components can be abstracted from the other. So you have very loose coupling uh, within your app, such that, for example, if I wanted to test my um, let's say my API service, right? I want to test a service that communicates with my API, puts data in, takes data out. In the testing framework, what I can say is, hey, AngularJS, I'm testing you now. Please swap out your HTTP backend with a mock backend, right? So that means to the controller, to, to, to the service, it looks as if it's still making an Ajax request, but what Angular has done when in testing mode is to swap out the code that makes the Ajax call and allows you to define dummy values to return. So you can very, very cleanly test um, just your application level code. You don't have to set up 
uh, mock database, you don't have to set up a mock web server just to be able to return uh, mock results and testing. You can say, here's a mock service, any call that the API service makes return uh, this set of predefined values. And then you go, that makes your testing very, very clean, right? Because all I have to do is support one component, I'm good to go, right? So we love tests, right? So this is an example uh, of what a test looks like. Right, um, those familiar with BDD will recognize this as behavior driven. So you know, same same like in I think it's Cucumber and in, in, in the other languages. You know, you say my code it should behave in a certain pattern, and then you write the code to validate that. So you can test things that are because uh, Angular renders your page in client side. You can test whether the right elements are rendered. You can test whether the buttons react in the way that you know you think they should react right so testing again very clean okay so Raywin just talked about testing and how you can swap out when you make HTTP requests you can say okay actually I want you to go to this fake HTTP server and return dummy values it makes the very clean ab abstraction between the client and the server and the question is how do you do that and uh, what Angular uses is this paradigm known as dependency injection. And this basically is you have a, you define modules. So we define a built in module. And this module has requirements. It needs to have certain directives, which we use to render Facebook. It needs to have certain controllers, which we use to control the application flow of the code. And certain services that actually make the request to get data. And certain filters for filtering data that we're displaying. And built in, our module just says that we want to require all these things and we don't know how we get it, but just, just give it to us. So in that, that giving process, you can actually swap that out for fake versions that you can test on. So here's just a very quick example, very simple. We're defining our module here, a built-in module, and we're just including our various models, controllers, directives, filters, and services. This is the very basic Angular layout. And we, this is, this is how the AngularJS team actually recommends doing it. And initially we went along with it and it was working for a while, but over time we kind of felt that the level of complexity of applications, like as you start building really big apps, just kind of becomes unmanageable. So before we get to that, let's, uh, let's kind of walk through the flow here. So here are your services, as I said. You know, these make your HTTP requests for you. Handle your business logic. And then you have your controllers, which will handle your application flow. So if something happens and you want to send an event that will display a widget saying like, oh, you know, you just finished your request. Would you like to continue on with uh, filling out a form? That would happen here. But your services are going and calling and talking to the server. And so for our directives in HTML, like we have these very clean abstractions because our directives in our HTML, as we've shown earlier, handle all of our UI and UX stuff. And these controllers and and services handle kind of the more business and flow of things. So Angular had recommended this approach. And we did it. And it was all right. But we thought, you know, we can, we can do better. This is, Angular is very much in a Wild West state right now. So there's a lot of room for improvement. And, you know, any individual can go out and make the framework better right now, which isn't something you can say about Backbone. So we looked at it and we said, okay. Right now, there's the MVC paradigm, where you have models, and you throw a bunch of models in a folder, and you say, okay, these are all the models from the application. I have all my views. I throw all my views in a folder, and we're just gonna like, break it apart into models, views, and controllers. It's the same thing with your clothes, right? You throw socks into a drawer, you throw shirts into a drawer, you organize it this way. And while this makes sense sometimes when you're keeping things very limited, sometimes you wanna present a full outfit. When you're selling stuff, for example, you don't say, okay, buy these socks. They're trying to sell this full outfit. This is an example from Guild Group because they realize that people don't want one item at a time. They want the whole package. So we thought, why can't we apply that to our actual application structure? And so what we did, instead of breaking things apart into models, views, controllers, is we said, okay, we're going to break things apart into widgets, into components. And here we can see we have our balances component, 
we have our currency component. As Ray would have said earlier, we are all about splitting expenses between friends. And we want to reflect that purpose in our folder structure so that anybody that comes and joins us as an employee can immediately go in and say, we want you to modify the invitation flow. And they know they can just go here and everything will be packaged within it. And Angular gives us that capability. Things like Backbone.js, not necessarily. And so we can look here at an example. So this is our currency module, right? And our currency module has a series of different widgets. And here we have our controller, our directive, and our HTML template. So everything this needs is right here in this directory. You don't have to go searching anywhere else. If I tell someone to go modify it, <coughs> boom, just go to it, it's done. And they can quickly and easily modify the code. And because we realize that we're breaking each of these things into little discrete chunks, we don't even have to give them long, complicated names. We can just call this .d, .js, because it's just a directive. It's actually almost a type of file, because only the directive is in that file. So we migrated. We said we need to reflect the purpose of the application. We need to reflect the product. And people think that there's a product team and there's an engineering team. But when you're working in an engineering force that really is trying to push that product forward, you need to see that the Venn diagram is much closer than you think. And so even our application code follows our product cycles. We can very clearly see as we made progressions of having a home page, having currencies, adding a history page. It's all very clear. And as a result, we've dramatically sped up our development time. So, unfortunately, that's a lot of JavaScript files. That's a lot to include on an index.html page, right? So we had to find a solution. How do we package all this stuff together and like throw it out there? And we, uh, we turned to Twitter. We basically like copied what people like Paul Irish, if you've heard of him, um, and the Twitter folks are doing. And they define this application flow that uses something called Yeoman to scaffold out and say, okay, all these are, are your different files, and now you just need to go and add your code. And then you use Grunt to build it, to package it all together. And then finally, you use Bower, which is a Twitter-made tool to manage the dependencies and what requires what. So Grunt is packaging, Yeoman is setting it up, and Bower is just saying that I want this, I want this. When I install it, I want it all to come together. And then we just brought this over to Angular, and it's worked pretty well so far. So how does this work? So we can just take, here's our home page, right? We can just say that, okay, I have my currency module that I want to require for the home page, because I know the home page needs it. I have my friends module, because I want users to be able to add their friends to do transactions with. I have my Facebook module, because I want to be able to connect with Facebook, and you know, be able to see their friends. But then, there are things in common, right? So you have a core. And this defines things like, what's the version number of your application? Um, are you in test mode? Are you in development mode? Are you in production mode? And this way, by extracting these things in different modules, the behavior of each of these can change without having to, this guy having to worry about it. It can just set up the configuration and everything magically just works. So, this was good. It was actually really, really nice. And over time, if you guys have ever gone to billpin.com, it's expanded as a website. And for single page applications, everybody runs up into this barrier where you're basically like throwing them the whole website. And they cast this website and they're like, wow, this is pretty heavy, man. So we're, we're, starting, we're starting to come up against that point. So what we decided was that we were going to move to more of a page-based structure where for each of your pages, you have an Angular app that you package together and all you have to do is include a single JavaScript file, a single CSS file, and each of your pages will have all its JavaScript functionality encapsulated together. And so you can set up all your different modules. All you have to say is that I have a page, and this page requires these seven different modules. So, you wanna? <laughs> all right. Yeah, okay, so. Right, so. AngularJS is very much a love-hate relationship. Like, because it is in this Wild West state where anyone can have an impact and kind of define what the best practices are and make it out there as an internet superstar for doing really, really great work on it, uh, there are a lot of issues. And what ends up happening is that when you first start using it, you write a directive, like you, do, you use Ajax and you never have to worry about it on your forms again. And you're like, this is incredible. This is just so magical. Like, this is beautiful. And once you actually start to get more co complex and kind of dive in, you'll run into all these different issues because 
Angular has that problem that most large frameworks like jQuery and all these others, excuse me, jQuery is not a framework, but um, most large pieces of code have where they try to do too much. So they don't do anything like all that well. And what ends up happening is that you just, you just, hit, you just hit a wall. So, the, so the, uh, the learning curve basically starts off as this gentle scope that you're really relaxing on, and then you just hit Everest. So it's very much like, Angular right now is very much an investment in time, and it's not recommended for anyone, or excuse me, for everybody, if you're trying to push your product out as quickly as possible. But if you have like a month or two, a little, little bit of leeway to work with it, it's highly recommended because it's incredibly powerful. But you gotta know what you're getting into. Because the documentation website is like, uh, yeah. Uh, Ray, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I, I think like, like Connor said, we went through the whole, you know, magical honeymoon period. But whoa, Angular's so nice, it's so neat, I can just repeat my list elements just like that. And then, you know, like, you saw in the beginning the code sample of the Facebook widget, right? It looks so neat and, and, and compact up front, and, and then you look at the code at the back, you go, oh, wow, right? Um, but the important thing is being able to gain a mastery of AngularJS has allowed us to scale and very rapidly develop the website, I think, much faster than if we had tied ourselves to, to other frameworks. There's a lot of things, uh, because of the basic philosophy behind AngularJS, the, the whole concept of encapsulating your functionality, testability, uh, I think it really has helped us move a lot faster than we would otherwise have. Right? So a lot of people, when first getting started with Angular, you know, hit that slope, you know, quite soon. And, you know, sometimes, yeah, I think we felt like, you know, uh, questioning ourselves, uh, are these things really, really worth it? But I think time has proven that it was really worth the investment. Now. Okay, I think. Should we, should we show our application structures? <laughs> <laughs> so before we started, Lopin, we had this grand idea, you know. Everybody talks about scalable architecture. Everybody talks about, you know, the best way to build new applications, right? We started out quite the same way, we had great ideas for architecture, it looked like this. <laughs> right? API, clients, JSON in the middle. Right? Simple as this may look. <coughs> right? But this also meant that because we did most of the rendering with Angular JS on the front end, and of course the native clients like iOS and Android um, did their own rendering with the widget, this allowed us to have a back end that spoke only one language, that is JSON. Nothing else comes out uh, from the back end, for, except serving the home page, perhaps, right? But because of this very, very clean separation, you know, we could just add a new app, a new platform that consumes the same back end API, you know, uh, fairly, fairly easily, right? We just get a new developer on board, here's the API spec, go. Right, we wouldn't have to tweak anything at the end. So this allowed us, a lot of developers to move very, very quickly, very, very independently uh, of each other. So yeah, that's Dobin's architecture. So I think we've come to the end of what we have. Any questions? Yeah, so what happens is that um, when you hit the page first, you know, we load up our entire app into your browser, and that app that is in the browser is simply going to make Ajax calls down uh, to the back end to retrieve data. So it's only data that's going back and forth between the client and, and the server. Right? So no full page refreshes or anything like that. Uh, but what we found is that it's fairly heavy. Right? Sometimes you don't really need all the functionality for separate pages. Right? If I'm resetting a password, I don't really need to know how to change my currency, for example. Right? So that leads into what Connor was talking about, about the next phase where we can break up these various components. Did I get it right? Yeah, this is, this is very much an ongoing process right now. We've identified these problems, and uh, what we've, we've taken on is the attitude of Kaizen, which is iterative improvement. If we see small things, like when we have time, we'll make them slowly better rather than doing the grand rewrite. Because the grand rewrite never comes, right? And so we've actually, with uh, 
with the new thing we're working on, we're starting to adopt the structure, and we're, we're really pushing that. Billpin, however, as a website, is still using the single page app format. And if we had thought about this a little earlier, like kind of worked towards it a little earlier, we probably could have avoided a few of the problems we ran into. Yeah. I think there's a question in front, yeah. Sorry, before that. Two, two, two questions there. Uh, do we have we considered required JS in terms of modularizing the code, and how how we do our testing? Mr. Right, Pollen, you think they're required? JS? Sure. So in terms of required JS, we we actually did look at it, and there was a point where we were considering to implement it. And Angular actually specifically says, oh, the reason that we don't do the functionality that required that JS does for everybody else, required that JS is basically. Uh, kind of a dependency library that lets you lazy load different libraries. So you only grab stuff when you really need it. And part of the reason that Angular supposedly didn't do it was because they thought required.js was doing a good job. And they said that, well, you can integrate required.js very, very easily. Unfortunately, that is not actually true. And we saw that it was a little too much work with what we were trying to push at the time. So we decided that we would, we would hold off on that. And Angular now, because they, they realized what they said wasn't really true, they're now actually working towards basically re-implementing required.js, which is kind of, uh, has its pros and cons. So um, for testing, the snippet that you saw just now was a snippet of end-to-end -end testing, that's right. So the test pretty much, uh, it simulates a user coming into the, uh, to the web page, ma making specific calls uh, through the application and seeing how the application reacts. We, for some legacy reasons, we do not have unit tests for the front end, so only legacy tests for those, uh, only end-to-end -end tests. Roland, you have a question? I have a question. Okay. Um, questions? What other frameworks are you What other frameworks are you Sorry, can you repeat that one more time? What other frameworks are Oh, consider. Okay. I mean, to be, to be very honest, we did a cursory, cursory look at the various frameworks in the market, and we decided that the way Angular JS did things was kind of the one that we were most comfortable with. So that's the one we went to. We didn't actually take time to, you know, test and experiment with each and every framework framework out there. Yeah. Yeah, to, to build on what Raywin had to say, uh, when I first joined Builtin, Raywin basically told me, hey dude, you need to learn Angular. Alright. But I had come from i come from a backbone background. And, and when I first started out with Angular, it's a very different way of thinking. And so I, I had a hard time adjusting, and I actually would have preferred that we did backbone. But after a few weeks or so, I saw the certain things like directives, especially, where you can define your functionality and throw it anywhere just in the HTML or have these beautiful custom elements, which is where the web is going right now. Uh, it's the future. So I, I, I've kind of been sold on it, and I don't think I could go back to backbone. Although I do miss the ecosystem back then. But Angular is starting to pick up more and more people, so that means no. Can you think I would do that? For development and testing? Okay, so he asked, what are the tools that we use for development and testing? Um, testing for, for the web app? We use the built-in AngularJS test harness, so they have a whole test framework built into that. So we just use that. Um, are you just talking about the front end side, or? Yeah, so it's so pretty much the one that's built into AngularJS. Uh, tools, um, Yeoman, Grunt, and Bauer. It's uh, on our show just now. Uh, and, yeah, the, are you, when you say tools, like what, what are you specifically referring to? Like our IDEs or just? Yeah. So we all use Sublime Text because they have a plugin system. And we're, we're big believers in open source because it lets us move fast. Like if we need to add some functionality that's not core to our product, we can just use that library. 
So the same reason why we use a class. AngularJS better rank is a Chrome extension that you can install. It allows you to inspect the AngularJS scopes uh, live in the browser. And it's really, really handy for understanding how your data is changing and how it's flowing around your app. So if you're looking into Angular, I would really recommend there's some great boilerplate projects out there. Better rank, Angular. Batman's better rank. Uh, AngularJS better rank. Kind of everything you would need for getting set up outside better rank, which is, which is a wonderful tool. But other than that, if you just take a look at, I think one of the names is MG Boilerplate. It's a, it's a great starting point. Uh, how are the backends that you use? Uh, is it Node.js or? Okay, I, huh? The, the backend back is Flask. Is Flask is the backend. Flask. Okay, I think, yeah. last question, anyone? Yeah, last question. No one, then I think, thanks so much for yeah, coming to the talk. Thank you very much. Thank you.